It's setting up and it should appear on the page momentarily. Welcome to Real Talk Livestream. It's November and we're starting to get ready for holidays and the Jamison family is getting ready to be with extended family for the holidays. And so um, we got thinking that this was a good time of year to talk about um, families and holidays with the broader group of the special needs community because we know that it is not easy to gather with family and friends over the holidays sometimes for some people and we add extra challenges and complications when we have um, a child or even a spouse with some special needs and as our families age we sometimes have grandparents that are having some new needs um, sometimes it's just dietary things people have but it gets complicated the more people you add to a picture and so um, my family um, thought we would allow ourselves to be, some of us got together today thinking we could be vulnerable and transparent and kind of share some perspectives from different generations and different parts of an extended family um, about what, what has, how things have evolved for us over the years, how things have gone well sometimes, how they haven't always gone well. Um, we wanted to limit it some just so we don't have a huge picture of a big group of people here for you and not everybody was available due to work and things, but I'll let everybody introduce themselves in a moment, but I'll start with myself and just give you a picture of what we're hoping today can be. Because we are not experts, we're just one family sharing their story, hoping to be a springboard to help others have conversations and open communication and grow and evolve as I think we are in the process of evolving. And we're just thanking you, you for joining in. There's gonna be a, a chance for you to ask questions um, in the comments. We're all, if you see us looking down at our devices, we're trying to set ourselves up for watch parties and so forth and um, be able to follow your comments on Facebook so that we can try to respond to those, at least from our perspectives too. So that being said, um, if I could just take a moment to pray, I'd really appreciate it. Heavenly Father, we thank you um, that we can have this opportunity with technology to gather as a special needs community today and just have a conversation. Um, Lord, none of us knows the answers, um, but you go before us and you come in behind us and you cover our families with love and grace. And we just wanna to learn to mirror that in our lives, Lord, so that we might experience um, richness in our relationships and um, honor you, God, and grow in you and minimize strife. <laughs> and, um, so we just ask you humbly, Lord, today to teach us through our rubbing up against each other and trying to meet together and whatever ways that might look this year even. And Lord, we ask you to help us to make sweet memories and to see you in them. Lord, not everybody gathering today even knows who you are. And so we just want to be respectful of where everyone is in their journey of faith or even just... Um, a life without that. We just ask you, Lord, to soften hearts and show us what you want us to see and draw people to you. And according to your will, Lord, we just leave this all before you and ask you to do your work and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Larry Skitt and Carly, we should try, we're going to try and introduce her and then she's probably going to sit in another chair. She's been really stressed out. So um, this, this week, kicking off kind of holiday preparations, we, of course, were without our caregiver. She gave me permission to share today that um, she may be back at any moment, but we're waiting on her getting a second negative COVID test because she had an exposure last week. She does not have COVID herself. She's had a negative test, but to if, take extra precaution knowing that we are going to be with extended family in just a few days. We asked her to wait before coming back and get a second negative COVID test a few days later, and it could come at any moment. 
So we've teased her that she should be in our driveway waiting for the doctor to call so that as soon as she's cleared, she can come in the house. <laughs> All that to say, Carly's been pretty stressed, bored while mom and dad tag team work and caregiving and but she's sweet, very sweet about it. She's been very loving. And um, so we'll introduce her first. This is Carly. Carly has Angelman syndrome. She is the person who first made us a special needs family. Look, look who's up there. You see them all? Waving at you. <laughs> yeah. Sister. And of course, you know, other things we've realized come up that we could all call special needs too. I was diagnosed with celiac disease several years ago. So when we get together, everybody's trying to be a little bit attentive and a lot attentive to um, my gluten-free needs. Larry has diabetes. Um, we've had extended family with aging con related conditions. And in the last few years, we've lost both of Larry's parents. Um, we have had Alzheimer's. We've had um, lots of diabetes and so forth. And so, we're going to try and share from kind of perspectives of different parts of the family, but this is Carly and this is who we celebrate today and through the holidays for all the things she's teaching us and stretching us to do. I'm Lisa Jameson and I'm a co-founder of Walk Right in Ministries, the host and sponsor of this Real Talk live stream. And this is my husband, Larry. I'm, uh, I'm the eye candy and comic relief. <laughs> <laughs> he's good isn't he okay we have three girls and carly is our youngest carly is 22 and our oldest is at uh, the top of my screen i don't know what she looks like to you tell us about yourself alex um like lisa said i'm alex i'm the oldest of the three um, and I live um, in Minneapolis, but not not at the Jameson's house anymore. So uh, I get to see them a little bit, but I, I live independently and work as a CPA. Aaron, and then our middle daughter is Erin. Hi, I'm Erin. I am uh, currently living in Redding, California. This will be my eighth year, I believe, living no longer in Minnesota near my family. So when I come home, it's just for short breaks. Luckily this year, it's going to be a little bit longer and get to spend some time with my family. But I'm the middle child. I am 25. And um, yeah, I, I don't live there anymore. So I experienced the coming home um, and the short uh, stays with my family nowadays, which is different. And this is the longest we've ever gone without seeing you because of COVID. We were all supposed to be together in California for um, a vacation in the spring that got canceled. So, um, <clears throat> and then we have my sister, Lori, if you couldn't tell that we were sisters already, <laughs> that's Lori. You want to tell us about yourself? Um, sure. I'm Lori and I'm the little sister and um, once little sister, always little sister. I live in Springfield, Missouri. And, um, and so our time as a family together is, um, gosh, it's, we've started to average about three times a year, a week at a time, sometimes more. So that's, that's a treat because it hadn't always been that way. And so we've been blessed in that. And so my husband and I live in Springfield, Missouri. We have two children. Um, my eldest is with us today and lives in India. And our daughter is um, coaching and working on her master's in Illinois. So that, thank you. Um, and we, we live in Minnesota. So we're right, right now represented on your screen. You have Minnesota, Missouri, California, and India. <laughs> and um, my parents live two and a half hours north of us um, most of the year and in Phoenix for part of the year. And Larry's family is spread out between Southern Minnesota and um, North Dakota. And are we missing anybody? That's it. So 
We've been a geographically dispersed family since I was born. I grew up a long way away from grandparents and only seeing people once a year usually. So, um, oh, look at Nathan got up and turned around. We see him representing the back of his shirt as Jim and Pythas. Thank you for doing that. We missed it this year. <laughs> All right, Nathan, introduce yourself. Yeah, I, uh, I live most of the year in India, except for 2020, but I'm finally back. And I typically don't spend as many of those week-long vacations with you guys anymore. Um, so anything that I say is drawn more on maybe uh, my memory than any recent experience. But uh, yeah, I've been here for four years. Mm -hmm. And, and actually, the distance for, for you and I has, has, I think, some ways deepened our relationship because we do these Zoom means meetings with more intention since you moved away. And that has actually brought more opportunity for conversations about um, the challenges, I would say, even of getting together for holidays. Um, and so you're kind of aware of some of the inside view of that. And I've really appreciated your sensitivity and interest in that. Um, and then you've also just grown up um, with kind of like all of us really, um, an evolving perspective on the impact Carly's situation has on you and on the broader family. And so I appreciate your being willing to come in today and kind of share about that. So I'll come back to that maybe in just a second. I wanna give a little more background of what we're doing today. Um, and again, please remember you can post questions in the comments for us. We'd love to respond to some of those. None of us really have any trouble talking, so <laughs> we can just talk right on if you don't have questions, but please feel free to, to add those. Um, really today, we, we wanna just paint a picture of what one family's experience has been like, and if you will, kind of two families, because we're, we're gonna try to share some broader perspective on the rep, those that aren't in our family, but not represented here. Um, and we wanna just give a springboard for conversation because I think one big thing we've learned continues to help us in this area is to just have a conversation. The more we talk about it, the easier it gets, the better we all get at it, the less the stress is, and the deeper our relationships are because we understand each other better. And in a family where the person with disabilities is nonverbal, one of the things my family's learned is that we kind of take for granted sometimes how intuitive we are or how much we even communicate among us as the caregiving sort of team um, without having to say anything. And so people like my sister, my parents, my, my sister-in-law, my nephew, these people all feel sometimes like they, they don't even know how to get inside of that world. So that is part of what happens in all of this. So we just wanted to explore some options about how we function, um, how, we're, how we're dealing with it in the context of COVID this year um, and respond to your questions. So, Again, we're not experts um, and we're spread out. So I think um, we, we went through a number of years where we were not all together very often at all, maybe once a year. Um, and so I wanna, I wanna kind of start with even Nathan maybe reflecting as a cousin on what it was like early on because we only saw each other maybe at the cabin with grandpa and grandma in the summer for part of a week or something, um, maybe once a year. And that gradually got to be more as I reflected on, I thought, I think where the shift started was when the kids were in high school and Alex was the first to graduate and everybody came for the graduation. And by that age and stage of life, suddenly there was a graduation almost every year and we were coming or going. Um, there were bigger anniversaries, grandpa and grandma were 50 or what are 50 years, you know, those sorts of things. And we haven't had any weddings yet, but those things start to happen. And I think one of the things that happened for me and all of that is realizing that everything started changing. It got in many ways more complicated, but much better to have had those times together in a, for a lot of reasons we'll reflect on. 
Um, but it took intention and I regret we didn't take more of that intention earlier. So one of the messages I hope comes across from our family to anybody watching who may have younger kids is how it pays off to go through a practice of doing this, it, even if smaller doses at regular pace, because it, the more you do it, the easier it gets, like anything. If you're only doing it once a year, it does feel like even a more major production and you're more worried about remembering because you don't have patterns of how you pack in place and all that kind of thing. And um, I, just, I just think, I wish we'd have appreciated the investment that it would be to, to do that more earlier on, but we didn't. So given that, maybe Nathan, you could start by just telling how you see the evolution of your um, experiences and perspectives has changed over the years. Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't, I mean, I feel like I don't remember super well some of the early years, but what I feel like I do remember was, um, you know, not that there's not health scares now um, continually, but I feel like there were certainly a lot more back then. And it, I was young, and so it was all kind of confusing anyways, and I didn't necessarily know what was going on or what the issues were. I mean, I didn't even have a basic uh, understanding of biology or health or anything. So I didn't, I just had no idea. And I just knew that there were really strict uh, requirements for Carly's room and how dark it needed to be and strict schedules. And that was all still being figured out too. Um, and probably still is to some degree. So um, I just didn't know at all um, how to help. And I don't necessarily that that's probably changed a lot over the years. I feel like I know at least small ways to help um, now. But uh, I do think that affected me, you know, maybe as a side note, I, I know that you've shared, you remember even better than I do, how much easier it was for me to be friends with uh, my friends in school who had varying degrees of autism or Asperger's or anything else that made most of my maybe atypical friends uh, or typical friends, I don't know the terminology, but that made a lot of my friends really uncomfortable. That for me, what maybe wasn't quite as uncomfortable um, and I was able to maybe be a better friend, uh, maybe indirectly because of being able to grow up at least to some degree, even you know, on rare vacations uh, around Carly. I do think, you know, and maybe we get more into this uh, now or later, but I know that mom, you've voiced this probably better than I have and you have as well, Lisa, at different times that um, it still is, I think, difficult to kind of get into that um, system that because you guys just have now that the system's developed like it is, I mean, it's uh, obviously still being tweaked, I think, but uh, it's robust and it's effective and it's hard to know how to jump into that and how to help even though we want to. Um, and so we've also had to learn um, and try to continually figure out how to communicate when we're available and how we can asking how we can help. Um, but I know sometimes it's easier to just do it yourself in your, your system than to uh, try to coach somebody else up to insert them into the system. So sometimes that even keeps me from offering. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of stuff in that, but I feel like that's kind of how it's developed that we're all comfortable uh, but we just don't know maybe what to do or how to help all the time. Yeah, I, you know, I will just interject to that. I think it's easier. First of all, you have to acknowledge if you're a parent in a family like ours, you have to come to a point of realizing that it's going to take some extra work to help others know how to help um, and, and have the long range vision on that for the extra work it's gonna be right now, it'll pay off in the future, that kind of mindset. Um, and it definitely is easier to do that when you're in your own place. We didn't always have the luxury of having others come to us. We usually have to go to others 
in, on both sides of our family. And so then we're already under extra stress of being out of our own routines, which makes us almost like for the parts that can be in control, we hold them even tighter, which makes it even harder for people on the outside to figure out where they fit in all that. So it's just an interesting thing to kind of keep in mind um, about that. Um, I'm also grateful that we did kind of, I think as people with intellectual disabilities get older, and I was warned of this gratefully many times when Carly was younger, they tend to become less and less flexible the older they get about everything. So I was encouraged when she was younger to try to keep stretching her to get out in the community, to meet a variety of people, to not be so dependent on routines, that sort of thing. And to find that balance between giving her routines and comfort zones and so forth, but also finding ways to stretch her out. And so I'm glad that we did have to travel a bit and still do. Um, I think that's benefited Carly and everybody else, but it, it, has, it has at times been very, very difficult not having more, more people coming to us. And I think, that's a whole dynamic too. You know, you have to really try to make it as clear to family as possible that they're welcome because they often think, well, we're just going to be an imposition. But we almost need people to come to us because it's easier to, we actually can relax more when people are in our house because Carly has her normal spaces and places and ways of being instead of having to fran frantically also be on watch of things she could get into in other people's houses and everything, using the showers, the bathrooms, everything is harder other places. So I'll stop talking, let somebody else jump in. Um, how have things evolved um, for you guys, maybe you, Lori, in terms of your experience of Carly and your perspectives about family and gatherings? Well, um, I, I will say I've I've had my own guilt about not coming to you more um, for whatever life reasons we we have not done more of that and I I wish that we had and hope that we will um, were because I am aware that there is a and I appreciate the intentionality you guys have have put in making the journey to come visit us um, because I do recognize and I don't I don't know that all people would in all cases that pulling Carly out of her routine although in the bigger broader picture you're seeing blessings and benefits to that it's not just logistically hard on you it's hard on Carly like like it can spur on all kinds of anxiety all kinds of health issues just from from different food different environment different places different sleep habits that she then has to adjust to and it can kick start a lot of issues that then you deal with even in the weeks in the aftermath of having made the trip and, and so that has to be a constant weighing for you, I'm sure of, is it even worth it? Yeah. Um, so, so for us to, to have you, we're fortunate to have a place where we can all gather that, that works well, but only to a degree because all those things are still very, very real. And so, um, so we have very much appreciated that intentionality from you, and 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 I will um, I kind of just want to go back and, and reaffirm even Nathan's and and Danny's exposure and experience, even as limited as it was some years with Carly. It is very real the impact that it has had on all of us from a comfort level, an awareness level, a compassion level for others that we meet. And it's very real in the sense that Nathan may feel some of that for himself. I may feel some of that for myself, but we've been affirmed in that from school teachers that watched our kids 
engage with other students in their school, Sunday school teachers that saw an, an enormous difference in how our kids responded to those with special needs in their Sunday school room and at church. And, and to me, that's very affirming that they really did glean from that, not yeah. just in their head and in their heart, but, but that it, it changed how they responded. Yeah. And that was I'm, really I'm so grateful you neat. brought that up because I hope people listening are encouraged by that. Because first of all, when you're only maybe seeing family or cousins once or twice a year, knowing that they're thinking about you and that it's influencing their lives throughout the year can really and should really encourage folks because we can feel really invisible to the rest of the world in our own home, especially when there's really stressful moments and situations. And so it can be helpful to literally ask the Lord to remind you that something bigger than you realize is happening here, even when you are completely by yourself inside your home. So that's, I appreciate that. And I appreciate your, you know, acknowledging um, the challenges of it, because those are not just real for us. There, the things you talked about are, are really very typical among a lot of families parenting someone with special needs. Can I jump in with something? Um, I was thinking about it as, as Lori was talking, but it's something I say often or find myself saying often when we're speaking, especially to moms of kids with special needs and talking about how they parent their other siblings and how they help them uh, kind of process what's going on and, and the guilt that can sometimes come when you know that life can be hard sometimes and it's not fair and all those sorts of things. And something I say a lot is, um, we don't need you to fix it, we just need you to care. And I think that that goes for uh, extended family members as well because I think sometimes like, like we've touched on, it can be difficult when <laughs> there's sort of a well-oiled machine in place and, you know, holidays, we're all trying to rest, but <laughs> Carly is not trying to rest. And we're all just running around trying to, trying to just, you know, make the most of it and do the balancing act. And sometimes extended family members can feel like, what do I, what do I do? I see you struggling, but <laughs> I can't help. And I think just, just a reminder is that we don't need you to fix it, but the fact that you care really, really matters. And those little moments of, can I help with something? Um, they, they mean a lot to me as a sibling to know my cousins, my aunt and uncle, they, they care and they see and they, they appreciate our, our system as a family and they care enough to try and help. And that really, that really matters. And we know no one can fix anything or um, it's not gonna be perfect, but to know we are all together as a family and it, and it matters to each of us is, is really important. And we've always had um, on, in parts of our family, Lori especially, constantly asking, and my mom and dad just constantly um, offering and asking like, how, what can we do? How can we help? And often we didn't have any response. We didn't know what to ask for, or what to say, or we knew we weren't letting people into our system as well as we should. But we, we got better at it over the years, I think. We continue to get better at it. We've even thought as a family about some new things we're gonna try this Thanksgiving. And um, oh, I lost my train of thought other than to say that. Um, I, I think that I appreciate when people don't quit asking. Like when we have failed to adequately respond to your attempts to help over the years, you still didn't give up. You still kept saying, just let me know what we can do. What can I get to have on hand when you're here? You know, whatever that was. Um, I, I just, we needed that. And I think most families do. So thank you for doing that. Um, on a practical level, I think one lesson that we're learning 
and have been learning for a long time is just plan ahead. I think that's, um, I think that's probably something about life with special needs that is annoying and frustrating sometimes is how much you have to plan ahead. But even just having some of these conversations or thinking ahead helps to um, set clear expectations and even um, have a plan outside of the moment. Because I, like we were just saying, you know, Lori has done a great job, grandma and grandpa, really our all family has done a good job of trying to ask. Often that ask comes in a moment of crisis or a moment of stress. And that's a great time to offer help, but it's a really hard time to verbalize what help looks like. So we can, as sort of the family, the caretaking team who knows the drill, um, even just think ahead to like, okay, what are ways that I know in two weeks when we see Lori, she can help with this and this and this, or what are ways we can talk about how we're gonna do Thanksgiving dinner ahead of time? You know, where is Carly gonna sit? Those conversations can happen way ahead of time and, and remove some of that anxiety and even the in the moment stresses. So I just feel like that whole like talk ahead of time, make a plan is really applicable across all, you know, everything. <laughs> most of the time, so. Yeah, good points. Having a plan, we've learned to kind of hold the plan loosely, as special needs families, but trying to have some plan, a plan that we can hold loosely is good. And the other thing you mentioned, Alex, is the expectation thing is, you know, we have expectations and we hold those loosely too. But being aware of what am I expecting? Sometimes I have expectations and I don't realize I have expectations until I'm now in a moment and now I'm feeling bitter or angry or frustrated or something. And I'm, I'm realizing it may not be fair, but now I'm emotional and it's hard to sort through all that. So to kind of pray it up, pray myself up. So we're, we're talking about preparing logistically and emotionally and relationally. There's just, there is a lot of preparation that has to happen. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree completely with that. And I think that we're getting better with that. But because we call this real talk, I'm going to take <laughs> this back to the realities of what happens in Larry's head. <laughs> um, and I probably haven't even oh, oh. disclosed this to... Uh, to many people on this this group, so this might be effective just for our family. But uh, and we've gotten we've certainly gotten better. But as as a dad with a child with special needs, um, holidays have been some of the hardest times for me. Um, really, really hard because what. What generally happens, and because I'm not very good at expressing my emotions in the moment, that means they all get stuffed inside. And so it just builds and builds and builds and gets worse and worse and worse. And I, and I become less and less social about it. But what I see happening um, at Thanksgiving, let's just use as an example, and you know, go back a number of years, um, where we would even try to have a meal like at a restaurant or something like that. And because of Carly's needs, we would put her on one end of the table and try to move stuff away from her so she couldn't grab it. And then I'd be sitting next to her. And then what would happen is all these conversations would be going on on the other side of the table while I'm focused on Carly. And, and it's kind of a metaphor for what I'm often feeling is looking around and seeing we're at a holiday. This is supposed to be a time for rest and fun and family. And everybody else is getting this but us. Now, that may not be fair at all. But I think we probably have some people watching today who can identify with that. So I'm not, I'm not trying to say that's the right way. I'm just trying to say that's the real way of what happens in my head. And when I get into that place, it's often accompanied with the whole, well, I'm just, I'm going to focus on what I can control here. I'm going to try to deal with Carly. I'm going to try to shelter everybody else so that they can have a good time. And yet my emotional state is Debbie Downer on everybody else. Um, and when I get into those places, 
you know, as people start to try to ask, how can we help? Um, you know, there are a couple things going on in my mind, but, but primarily is that I don't believe that anybody really wants to now. And that's, that's completely on me. Okay. That's not on anybody else here, but I'm just saying that sometimes it's hard for me to believe, do you really want to help? And oftentimes we're in an environment, as Lisa said, has talked about earlier, where it's not our own. And so, you know, if Carly messes up our couch, um, it's unfortunate, but it's mine. If Carly messes up somebody else's couch, that's a way huger deal for me as a dad. And so I'm trying to, I'm trying to guard against all these things are going on in my head and it's just not a very nice place to be. So again, I'm not, I'm not advocating that this is the right way. I'm just trying to tell you, this is what goes on in my head. And I think that I have a wife and I have daughters that are helping me through that. <laughs> um, and, and we really do have a great family around us. But I can also say that, um, as Lisa talked about, the importance of being asked um, and the importance of asking again and again and again um, is incredibly important because eventually someone like me starts to hear it. And eventually someone like me is like, wow, they really do want to do more than I give them credit for. And, and eventually I come to the place where I'm like, wow, this is cool. Uh, families like ours tend to feel very hypersensitive about how needy and complicated we are. <laughs> and so when people offer help or, or appreciation or sympathy or something, usually the first time or the first few times they do that, you in your mind, you're just thinking, oh, they're just feeling bad. And they're just saying that to be nice. But you're not convinced that anybody wants to be in the world that you're in because you don't at that moment want to be in it. <laughs> I will, I want to not skip past something you said without offering a little bit of a tip that's worked for us that may work for others. Um, a couple of years ago, not very long ago, I don't remember why we didn't do it sooner or what started us doing it, but when we went out on a date night shortly before leaving on a vacation, we had a, a conversation about, you know, recognizing there are going to be things about this trip that are going to be hard, disappointing, frustrating, but asking each other, like, what, what would need to happen for you to consider considered a, a successful vacation or holiday or whatever it was. Um, recognizing that it's not going to be perfect and we can't control everything, but if of the things that we could control, are there one or two things that would really need to happen for you to be satisfied adequately with what happened over the course of those days or whatever? And we kind of talked that through and we each shared something and, and then kind of committed to each other to do what, what each of us could do for the other to make sure that happened for the other person, you know? And it was, it, again, it was still hard and it wasn't perfect, but there, there, was, there was something about it that really just having the conversation and having kind of a little goal in there really helped. Yeah, it did. Do you remember what you said when I asked you that? No. <laughs> I wish I could, but I re I vaguely re recollect um, your um, talking about something that Ale actually Alex brought up a week ago and that we have a better definition of like compartmentalizing some of our tag teaming because our family, especially now that we have older daughters, tends to kind of just tag team all Carly's cares throughout a day and very little of it when we're all together is compartmentalized. Okay, like you've got her now for two hours. So somebody else knows they can completely check out and go play a game or do a puzzle or watch the movie with the family or something. Otherwise, we're just kind of all on hyper alert all the time. Like whose turn is it? You know, or I want to help. I don't want them to have to do it again. So I think that was part of it. But there was something about a nap in there too, I think. Like if you can get a nap every day or something. Yeah, I'd love to jump on that because I think that's pretty practical. Um, 
and you know i'm i'm 25 alex is 27 carly's 22 and we've we've done this trip to the lake um in missouri what 15 times at least now probably more and we're just this year alex suggested what if we put together a tentative schedule of who's in charge at what times <laughs> and Honestly, I'm surprised we haven't thought of it before. And I think the reason we've probably resisted it in the past is because it feels like that's our whole life. Like I remember even growing up as a kid and thinking every, you know, that, that season of life I was in where I was like, our world really does kind of revolve around Carly to some degree. And just thinking, you know, wherever we go, whatever we do, it's who's watching Carly and for what amount of time and where's our window and our whole life has a schedule. Behind the scenes, behind the curtain is Carly's caregiver schedule. Um, and I think on holidays, it feels like it should just be family. It should just be relaxed. And I think mentally we hope that we'll just be able to turn off the reality of, of needing to plan um, but the truth is it ends up making things worse because we start assuming, you know, well, somebody will be awake in the morning to get Carly up. But the reality is Alex is sleeping in the room with Carly. So Alex will be awake when Carly wakes up. But Unless somebody intentionally goes and gets her. Right. Ooh, for me. <laughs> <laughs> but it means like, you know, we're assuming somebody's just going to magically wake up to get Carly up because we didn't ever really talk about who was gonna get Carly up. And then all of a sudden Alex is getting Carly up and then mom gets Carly up cause she, or Aaron comes and feels bad that she didn't get Carly up because Alex has to get Carly up every day. But Alex likes sleeping in the room with Carly for some reasons, but, and there's all these sort of unspoken and then everyone starts feeling guilty and starts feeling like they need to rescue each other. Like, oh, mom's stressed, so I'm gonna jump in, but now I'm stressed and mom's stressed because she was in the middle of something and now I'm trying to take over and blah, blah, blah. And it just kind of becomes this swirl of, of chaos and everybody feeling guilty and sad and angry and everyone's on high alert every moment, like every, there's no moment where you're not thinking who's got Carly. And yeah. if you, or if even you, if we decide the night before, right. A lot what we've done yeah. this year, we're taking a step back and doing it all the way, like a week or two, all before, the way before so that we're not constantly making decisions. The whole yeah. time. I mean, well, somebody, somebody has mentioned that even during this, this pandemic that everyone has what they call decision fatigue because mm -hmm. every single decision you make now matters like am I going to the grocery store today just became a really important decision whereas six months ago it didn't you didn't think twice about going to the grocery store and so every decision you make is is so high stakes that people are actually getting exhausted from having to make decisions and I think that's a great picture of of a special needs family. It's like it, it, the decision about whether or not you're going to go to the bathroom right now is a really big deal because what if Carly grabs that plastic bag and chews on it? Or what if she, you know, there's so many things. And I think during a vacation when there isn't that set in stone or, or set in some way um, idea of who's watching her and all that stuff, you can there's a constant high stakes emotional decision being made and everyone feels guilty about it. Whereas if you can plan ahead <laughs> or we'll, we'll let you know if, if it works, but <laughs> when you can plan ahead and make some of those decisions. So at least there's some level of I'm, I'm off the clock and it actually could bring a certain amount of amount of peace to everyone. <laughs> Well, I would, I would care to speak to that a little bit just because um, it, it didn't happen so intentionally the last time you were here, but, but it happened that sort of a crisis happened and all of a sudden you were short on your caregiving machine. And, and so I was given the opportunity to help with Carly for a section of time in a day. 
which is not my normal. All the things we've talked about, my normal is to sort of just stay in the peripherals. Um, uh, Y'all gave me credit for offering to help. I don't feel like I really do. Um, there's probably a lot to that, but but my staying on the peripherals is somewhat seeing that there's already. Uh-oh, she's cracking up. <laughs> Well, we'll let her Jumping. come back. Oh, we might be getting it. Sorry, we lost you for a second. Oh, how about, how, where should I go back to? <laughs> you said you, some of the reason you stay on the peripheral and then we lost Is you. There are, there are several of you in your machine. And so it feels like maybe there's a lot of chiefs and you don't need another in the mix. And so I just stay in the background, hoping that you'll tell me if there's something I can help with. But, but kind of like you spoke to earlier, in the moment is maybe not the off best time to offer help. That I could do better at offering help in those benign, easy moments of, hey, I am here when you need me, but I don't know what to do. So you'll have to direct that. So then going back to your last trip here, when I actually helped with Carly for a chunk of time, you had other things, commitments you had to do, Larry was working. That was, that was a blessing to me in, in a lot of different ways that I saw a way that I could step in and help where it was needed. I needed guidance in order to feel equipped to do that well because a lot of times it is a matter of you live so far away. I don't see Carly on a daily basis or even weekly basis. It's in chunks of time and then months apart. And as you know, and, and most listening know, it's an ever evolving. What, what Carly's behaviors and triggers and nuances were six months ago might be completely different now than the last time I was with her. And so I don't necessarily capture those. And so um, having spent a chunk of time with her that day was, was an opportunity for me to help. A period of time that you gave me that was an easy period where there weren't a lot of Carly needs of medications or feeding or any of those things. So I was somewhat free to do what I wanted with her, but to be the, the person in charge, so to speak, that it was on me. If she needed something, it was on me to respond to her to the next day. Even I felt more equipped to step in. I felt more aware of her nuances of, I think she needs to go to the bathroom and maybe captured that before someone else did that I don't normally necessarily even notice or engage in because I'm just trying to stay out of it, but available. Mm -hmm. And that, that connectedness of spending that time with Carly, that was really one-on-one, -on -one, just me and Carly not only helped me feel more equipped for the next time I might help with her, made me feel useful and helpful, but it helped me connect on a relational level with Carly more than I normally do because it was just her and me, you know? I think I realized that day how important it was. Why, and I kind of thought, why have we not thought of this before? Give it a smaller period of time, an easy section of the day, relatively and get, I get literally wrote you a list I recall I think of what you during this hour at some point she'll need to go to the bathroom at some point she's going to need a drink or whatever it was you know just to give you yeah, some, just some basic basic tools and guidance on on what her needs might be and they were fairly simple like you said it was a chunk a period of the day that was sort of a, a gap of just some simple things but it was, um, it was, it was just, it was rich for me on a lot of levels to participate in that way. That normally just doesn't happen. Um, and so um, 
And, and of course, there's there are those that are always wanting to help, feeling like it sounds empty when I offer it, like Larry said, or that it was a terrible time to offer it because it's in crisis moment. And, and it's just easier to fix it yourselves because you all know what's needed. And, and so that's not the time for me to offer, yeah. you know. Thanks for bringing that up. I'm watching the clock. So I want to, I mean, there's so many things we could touch on, but I want to make sure there's a couple, I want to give everybody, if there's something burning, I want a chance for that to be brought up. But I also want to mention something that comes up real practical opportunity with um, family gatherings too, is that family picture. <laughs> the, um, the challenges of a family picture can often be very complicated with a bigger group of people. And then you add someone with special needs who maybe doesn't even know how to look at the camera or something. Um, but um, I've literally, we often forget to even do them. And so I'm, I literally have started putting it on like my little phone app to-do list thing to make sure we get a picture while we're all together for Thanksgiving. And um, I think learning, um, there's so there's a bigger picture in the picture <laughs> it's the the power of having a picture in the house of the group even for carly to see and to start learning the concept of this is my family even though i don't see them all very often and how over the years um our the, my children and your children and on the other side of the family as they get into adulthood, they mature, they've gone through their different stages of angst with their sister and their cousin. And um, the pictures remind us of how far we've come. The pictures of, of remind us who we're, we're with. And as we start to get to an age where we're even more in tune with thinking about the future for Carly, for Alex and Aaron as care coordinators for her more and more as the future comes. Um, I'm appreciating that one of the investments of this, what I see in a picture in this family unit, even when they're dispersed literally across the world from each other, is there's this support system that will be there for Carly emotionally, if not always able to be logistically, um, that this investment in having conversations like this and being together for holidays despite all the challenges is creating a relationship between even Nathan and Alex and Aaron and your daughter Danielle um, that that ripples into um, equipping Alex and Aaron to have community around them as they continue to care for Carly um, voices of people who care about Carly so that even if they don't ever live in the same state, if we were gone, Carly has people around the world who love her, who are going to be watching to make sure that whoever is in charge at different stages of her life are caring well for her. And that gives me an incredible peace. That is something that's come out of this evolving family system we have that's blessed me incredibly as she's become an adult reflecting on the power of that that comfort that peace and knowing there's a system of people who will be having her back and having Alex and Aaron's back and our back as we get older that's really powerful that to me is one of the greatest ways that this pays forward into the future Mm -hmm. So um, I want to make sure we talk a little bit about COVID too, because that's complicating a lot of this for people this year. Um, and just on a practical level, talking to a number of other families, there's everything from people just saying, we're getting together. It's more important and we'll do what we can, but they're not even that worried about it. Others um, have taken different measures to try to be safe, but be together. Others, for various reasons, cannot. We have neighbors who's the grandpa has been in cancer treatment for six months, and he's got a weakened immune system, so they won't be together at all. Um, but families are doing everything from Zoom gatherings 
dance parties to um, we have beefed up our bonfire pit situation in the backyard so that it, we could have a few gatherings if we need to where people can be outside and socially distance but together and it'll be winter and snowy but we've, we're figuring um, we literally bought a new portable bonfire pit that's supposed to kick heat out to the sides more so it doesn't just all go straight up you know <laughs> And the neighbor was just telling me yesterday they've, tried, they've bought five different heater systems to try and find the one that works the best to add some more heat to the backyard. So I, I just think it's in some ways it's great that we have potential tools to help make it possible. We're having to be more creative than ever. And I appreciate that while there's exposure, we're trying to limit it between getting from here to Missouri, there, the, everyone who's going to be there has, has agreed as a family to um, strict quarantining for the last two weeks. We were all pretty quarantine anyway, but we've all agreed to just really like everything was canceled, haircuts, nothing ex extra at all, so that we could all try and go be safe for grandpa and grandma, for Carly, for Larry with diabetes, for others with immune issues. So um, I don't know if there's anything more to add to that, but I wondered, you know, Nathan, you've just traveled across the world too and are seeing it from an international perspective, but for our families being generally much more vulnerable and needing to stay isolated, I think it's worth having conversations, being respectful of other people's boundaries, and just trying to do be as creative as we can be to have the kind of gatherings that we can have. Um, what else? Well. I, can, I don't know if other people are looking for creative ideas, but I can say that even while you all visited in September, Nathan was stateside with us, but his activities didn't allow for him to quarantine the same way that we could. And so as other families get together that maybe don't feel like everyone that's been with them have quarantined well, um, but they have decided to be together. I was super appreciative of Nathan while he was here with his comings and goings of his willingness to mask when he was in, in group places with us. Um, and, and where in, in terms of we were fortunate that he could keep his own bathroom that was isolated to himself. And, and when we ate things like tacos and there were lots of extra things that you couldn't just serve the plate to him and be done for the meal, we gave him his own condiment tray and he had his own fancy to touch. And he, well, sat at the, he sat at the far end of the table, but he wasn't offended by those things. He was very yeah. willing to do those things. And it takes oh, that- Is that, that why he did that? Well, and now that you bring that up, we we also he played Farkle with us, a dice game, several times, and Lori gave him a separate set of dice so that we didn't have to share um, all handling the same things. But we we were still able to have him play a game. We were a little bit further down the table, and he had his mask on and he had his own dice. But so there there were ways we made it work. Yeah, and for, but it does take both sides. Go ahead. Yeah, well, and some of that takes more planning too. I mean, some of that goes into the, the decision fatigue and all of that too, and um, having to think through that somewhat in advance. And we'd already been kind of doing that as a, a nuclear family. So it was, maybe came a little bit easier. Um, but I will say that I underestimated how difficult that that was. And for me, uh, stacked on top of some of the same things that we were talking about um, with wanting to help but not knowing how and then being further limited almost entirely um, it felt like by the COVID thing because not only did I have my mask on but it's like that's that doesn't really make as much sense if I'm hugging Carly all the time and helping her walk around and catching her when she's about to fall and things and so I felt very limited um, to even be able to help with some of those really basic things that maybe I normally would and being able to dance with her around the living room um, that I just, I felt like I couldn't do. And so, yeah, my circumstances, you know, didn't allow me to quarantine, but um, in hindsight too, I just say to anybody else in that kind of position, I really wish I would have 
uh, somehow been able to uh, because it uh, I underestimated how difficult that that would be. As we, you know, get close to the end of our time, I think that's worth, it's just worth acknowledging that we're really blessed with a family who, even if they haven't always known how to help, they've always had good intentions. And we know people watching right now may not have the same situation. So many of you might have families who are openly um, frustrated with the complications of your life. Um, there may be a lot of your family that seems that way, it really isn't. Um, and your holiday systems might be a lot different than ours. Ours usually involve travel. Some people's don't involve travel at all and are just one day of Thanksgiving meal or Christmas meal, and it's still really hard even to spend four or five hours with that family. So I think it's just worth saying, you know, it's, it's more complicated because of disability, but just remember to every family has drama. Um, everyone has all of that. And something I've learned that's completely unrelated to disability is just that vulnerability invites vulnerability. So if you can kind of set the stage on the front end with your family and say, you know, this is going to be challenging for us, but this is how we want to engage in this family. Hopefully then you can get a more positive response from, from family members. And again, like we've talked about throughout this hour, make a plan, talk ahead of time and leave space for questions and grace for each other. That's so good, Alex. And really, you know, COVID is kind of a gift in a way to opening a door for more of that conversation this year than we might normally have. It would be easier without COVID to slide into autopilot mode and just do it the same way we've done it every year. But it kind of has created an opportunity for a reset for everybody to kind of step back and say, you know, how can we do this differently this year? How do we need to do it differently this year? Do we need to do it differently this year? Um, and just ultimately have conversations. Um, I think that parents set a tone, you know, we set a tone, Lori, you've set a tone, mom and dad have set a tone, Larry's folks set a tone, um, and it's not always a good one, but um, we need to be aware that we have some influence to set a tone, and um, and like you said, have grace for each other. Um, as we wrap up, I will, I will echo that in another way and saying, we got to be careful about how much power we give the disability. Um, we can give it way too much power. We can blame it for everything. The reality is that if our family, your family, anybody watching were to get a group of people together for a holiday or a birthday or anything, there's going to be dynamics. It's going to have its challenges. And often we want to blame it all on the disability. And the reality is it's just not always easy to get together with a large group of people, especially family. And yet it's worth it to have the great, it's worth it, you know? Um, so I, I just, I think that we need this vulnerability. You, you literally spoke from my, my notes, Alex. I'm so glad you put it perfectly. Vulnerability and opportunity for reset might be a great place to just end here. Um, so I, I will put some scriptures that I wanted to share in the show notes. Um, because we ran out of time, but some really encouraging scriptures I will put in the show notes along with how to reach us if you have more questions or if you want to find out what else is offered by Walk Right In Ministries, you can visit our website. We're all over social media. Um, we have this real talk we do once a month right now on a, the second or third Thursday of a month at noon. And then they're archived on YouTube as well as on our Facebook page. So you can watch this back and share it with others. We appreciate when you do that um, because it really helps sp spread awareness and hopefully encourages people that they're not alone. This is a common experience and there's um, ways to go through it well and we're not all doing it well all the time. Um, next month, we're going to kind of take a break from all the just tips and conversations and everything and have kind of a Christmas 
concert slash story time um, with a uh, singer songwriter, Dove award winning Reggie Ham. His daughter has Angelman syndrome and he's gonna be with us sharing some music from his album. He's multiple songs out over 20 number one hits. Um, just a prolific songwriter, uh, author, blogger. He um, he's written. I was just I just have to do a little promo because it's going to be great. You'll, I hope you'll join us on December 10th. Um, we'll be announcing that tomorrow on social media. Where did I put the list? Reggie has written songs for Clay Aiken, Backstreet Boys, Rascal Flats, Jackie Velasquez, Rebecca St. James, Mercy Me, Clay Cross, Gaither Vocal Band, Point of Grace, Mark Schultz, Barb Carlisle, Dallas Holm, Joy Williams, Avalon, and more. It's just a mouthful. He's an amazingly talented man, very fun, very funny. We'll have some conversation. He's written um, two years ago, I believe it was now, he wrote a book called One Silent Night, along with a whole soundtrack of music um, that fits with the book. And he's gonna be sharing, playing some of his music, especially focusing on the Christ Christmas stuff um, and telling, reading an excerpt from One Silent Night and sharing some personal stories of being a dad in a special needs family. And it's just gonna be really fun and entertaining. So I hope you'll come back on December 10th and join us for that. Anything else? Did I miss anything? I think our team. Friends, go make some sweet memories this holiday season. It'll spur you on to have them. Memories are spurring for my, my family, and I know they will be for yours too. Let me pray. Larry, how about you pray? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for, uh, for bringing us together. We thank you for... Um, the experiences that we've talked about, both um, positive and, and some challenging areas as well, uh, but that's life, Lord. Um, lots of sweet times, but lots of challenging things too. And so we know that as we approach this time of, uh, of the holiday seasons, of Thanksgiving and Christmas and family gatherings, that, um, that there will be sweet times, but that there will be challenging times as well. And we just pray that you would help us to, uh, to communicate well through that, um, that this holiday period would be a time that sees families um, grow uh, more deeply um, together. Um, and whether their family situations involve special needs or not, Lord, would you just go before them and, uh, and provi provide safety and sweet times uh, for all of us and for all of them. So we thank you so much for, for uh, everybody here, everybody listening, uh, everybody who's participated today, uh, just such a blessing to us. We pray all this in your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you to my family for joining us and um, for everybody watching. We hope to see you again in a month, if not before. Happy Thanksgiving. How do I turn the recording off? <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. I have to end the meeting to um, end the live, I think, so we can come back. <laughs>